think it is. It's, you need to go to the doctor tomorrow because we think you're getting a flare. So anyway, I, um, five years down the road, uh, I started looking for a support group because I didn't want to feel abnormal. I wanted to decrease the feelings of isolation. I wanted to talk to somebody about the problems and how to overcome them, or if you can't overcome them, how do you deal with them? I wanted to talk about benefits. How do you apply for them? What are you entitled to? What are you not entitled to? How do you return to work? What about education? Um, what, do, what can I expect with the disease progression? And what about the drug side effects and how do I manage these? So these were things that were important to me and I felt I needed to talk to somebody else that had a similar disease to me to be able to, um, to get the answers. So I decided to send my husband and two sons off on a Mara cycle, to cycle from Belfast to Dublin and then back again. Uh, and get sponsored for it. So they raised £225 um, and we set up the support group in 2010. Um, we, the aims we decided would be to uh, provide support for each other, to raise awareness about the different vasculitis diseases, to share information um, and because we're all rare, there's about 15, maybe more, vasculitis diseases, and we're all individually rare. But when you accumulate them all together, it's, it's a fair wee number. So we decided to include, be inclusive of all that were affected by any of the vasculitis diseases in the island of Ireland. And we wanted to assist research into improving current management and treatment. We were very fortunate there was a uh, young specialist vasculitis consultants came back to Ireland from America and from England. And this was the start of great things for us. So I'm sure some of you are aware of these two gentlemen, uh, Dr. Eamon Malloy out in St. Vincent's and Professor Mark Little. And we're very fortunate. We have a very good, close working relationship with these men. So we were on the road. We uh, started going to meetings with the Northern Ireland Rare Disease Partnership to find out about other groups that have had dealing with rare disease. We started coming to the IPOSI workshops. Um, we decided we needed to get a, uh, meetings with the Department of Health on both sides of the border to see, you know, like what were they going to do about vasculitis care. Um, we decided we needed to um, become a charity to become credible. So we got our charitable status in 2012, but we actually uh, got launched in Stormont by the then uh, Minister of Health in 2013. Um, I think it was 2014, was it, that um, I came across you, Patty. I applied because I thought at that stage of my journey, um, I was on the highest level of the treatment for my particular disease and I didn't know what the options were beyond that. Um, so this course came along and I thought, well, if I learn a wee bit more about research and development, we might be able to see how can we, you know, like maybe speed the process up or how can we get access to research and development. So <clears throat> I did the, the course, but this is the slide, and I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but I hope you have access to it at some stage. But this slide, for me, um, epitomizes you, Patty, because it says about the patient involvement, what we can do as patients to get involved in research and development. And it's not just enough that we're, we come in at the end, that we take the tablets or we, we have the intervention. We need to be there at the very beginning because we need to be there helping to set the priorities um, and setting the protocols and being there involved in the ethical decisions, uh, being involved in the risk and benefit decisions. So we have a very vital role. Um, I was talking to you about Professor Mark Little and Eamon Malloy, so we, we have a lot of collaboration. We have annual conferences, so we learn an awful lot from our speakers, but our speakers learn an awful lot from us, the, uh, our, the nitty gritty of living with the diseases. So there's a UK and Ireland vasculitis registry, 
and there's also the Trinity Health Kidney Centre have a biobank. So whenever uh, we were looking at this at the beginning, there was an awful lot of uh, suspicion about research. So we got the research team to come in and explain what happened to the samples and why they needed the samples and who owns the data and all those questions. Um, and then we decided then we needed to re redesign the consent form. And after that, we found that there was a big uptake of people coming into the registry and the biobank. This is the, the what would you say, the report from this year. But whenever I was doing this, this slide, um, I, was, I saw the, a slide from 2014. And the vasculitis patients that were involved at that stage was 225. So there it's, it's 668 there this year, which is brilliant. But because there's been so many uh, new samples, they've been able to do more research. And we have, there's been a discovery of a new protein, CD163. And this protein is uh, present during a kidney vasculitis flare. And why is that important? Because that identifies when you're in a flare immediately. There's no invasive biopsy. The treatment can start immediately. You're not being put on antibiotics, one course of antibiotics, just in case you're, you have an infection and then that didn't work, so you go on another course of antibiotics and you're wasting valuable time. You're on needless courses of antibiotics. So with this protein, it's just a little dip in the urine and, and you see that it's there and the treatment can start right away. It's less aggressive, doesn't last as long and people can usually carry on with their daily life. They're not taking time off sick. Um, March this year, we were very lucky. We are, uh, we've launched a five-year project to determine environmental factors which trigger flares. And this is a very collaborative project. These are all the team players. So we have Tala Hospital, St. James's Hospital. We have the ADAPT Centre for Digital Content. There's Trinity College, uh, School of Computer Science, there's the Registry and Biobank, and there's also Patient and Power, because uh, in order to be able to do this bit of research, we had to develop an app. So we've developed an app, a vasculitis app, it's free to download, and that will tell us, you know, like what medication we're on, when to take it, what appointments we uh, need, and what, who we've seen, what the outcome of the different appointments are. So we have all that on our phone whenever we go to our appointments because we go to an awful lot of different doctors. We're not selective. We go, we, <laughs> whatever organ is affected, we're away to that ology. So this is all kept on a phone and we're able to have that record there. We're also involved in the Vasculitis Ireland network. So this is uh, where the patient group is working with the specialist vasculitis consultants that are very, this slide is actually out of date because we've been able to get a pediatric consultant on board now, Orla Killeen, and we also have uh, three consultants from Northern Ireland on board, so it's, it's expanding. The idea behind this is that we are going to develop a care pathway so that uh, somebody that's diagnosed or is suspected being diagnosed with vasculitis, doesn't matter where in Ireland that happens, that they will be put on a care pathway and they will receive the same level of care no matter where they live. This is more about our app. I think I've covered that earlier. So, um, But the other thing the app will, will gather is, uh, you know, like lifestyle, changes, you know, like say if you had gone for a long walk or whatever, or um, we have, uh, you know, the five quality of life questionnaire, the five questions on it, um, and the GPS on the, the app will pick up environment, will be able to pick up your area, so that can be tied in with meteorological data, so we could find out if there's any uh, what do we say, pollination or viruses or any environmental factors that trigger our flares. So I started off trying to go faster than walking. So I ended up um, and I, um, I did the 50K cycle whenever, you know, the zero was in, in um, Belfast. So I did the 50K cycle and that's my son that's with me there. 
But I started off as a patient looking for to support, looking for answers to talk to somebody else in the same boat as me. And I've ended up um, creating a, an organization for all of Ireland um, and been quite actively involved in uh, research. I'm now sitting on uh, both the IPOSI board and the NIRDP board. I'm involved in PPI groups on both sides of the border. Um, I've sat in, a, what was it, a patient advisory board, you know, like about a new research project. Would, would this be suitable for patients? Would patients buy into this? And that's all because of doing the UPATI course, because um, whenever I learned about the processes, I realized that we actually, as a patient, have a very important voice. Um, I had another slide, and it's not on there, and it was a really good slide, and it was, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it was about the different perspectives of people. So we all have our own perspective, and each perspective is correct, but we need to put the whole lot together to get the full picture. So it's like the jigsaw. We need to get everybody's perspective in there, and we as patients need to realize that we have a very important perspective. We have the lived experience. We don't have the medical knowledge with all our, you know, like IT knowledge or anything like that, but we have the lived experience, and we need to take more responsibility and step up and, and share that, that because nobody has crystal balls in this game. We just So anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. Julie Sen, she should have introduced me, but uh, I actually probably know three quarters of the room anyway, so I think you're okay. Um, the people say you should never meet your hero, but um, I have the pleasure of having my hero on my board. So this year was a great year for IPOSI, and not only did we launch our first patient education program, but Julie Power joined our board of directors. So thank you, Julie. That was great. Um, so I'm going to try and follow that up, um, and for anybody who doesn't know IPOSI, um, I suggest you just literally check our website. I'm not going to describe what it is we do, but that's what we do. And um, I stood here last year um, talking about how we were going to create a new environment for health research, and particularly for clinical research in Ireland. And I spoke with another UPATI graduate, uh, Joan Jordan. And um, I thought I'd give an update as to where maybe patient and public involvement has grown since then and some of the uh, initiatives that, that we've managed to get off the ground. And our moniker is turning patients into partners and I think Julie is a perfect personification of that because I think every single one of the speakers already has already mentioned the importance of patient involvement. Um, and where we're at in Ireland now is that it's no longer about why, but it's about how, and how we do that well, how we do it systematically, and how we can grow our patient community, because we feel in IPOSI, and we actually, uh, we've evidence to back it up, there's a huge appetite in the public and among the patient community to get more involved. But they need to be supported in the roles that are being created for them. And this is where the importance of patient education comes in, because we see a, an enormous impact uh, of providing the kind of education and the kind of training to patients. Uh, and we've, we've learned that from uh, being involved in the UPATI initiative. And I think there's a lot of parallels with today in terms of uh, just hearing uh, Jacques Demot speak about the importance and the value of ECRIN and hearing um, hearing the HRV talk about we need to increase the value of, of research. Well, the value of, of education can go an awful long way, and a little bit of education, as personified by, by uh, Julie, can have an enormous value and an enormous impact. So we have had nine Irish patients go through the PATI course, and there's four more that are currently on um, the current iteration of that course. 
And we've seen a great impact fr uh, from, from them in our work in IPOSI, but also on the research community in, in Ireland. And if you compare last year with this year, um, we now have leadership within the research community looking at patient and public involvement. And really, I have to commend the, the HRB and the Irish Research Council in launching the PPI Ignite Awards, which Ray mentioned briefly earlier. And these five key PIs are going to be driving uh, a structured approach to, to PPI within our university sector. And this is actually, um, I, we just came back from Berlin yesterday with the uh, UPATI initiative. And this is the envy of Europe because nowhere else in Europe have they actually thought about PPI from the point of view of the research community and how it benefits their career. And it's very much around um, structuring it, putting in metrics, but also realizing that the benefits can go both ways. So both researchers and patients need training as part of this. And we also have an increasing amount of agency in, in our uh, policy level and in our health service level. And I, uh, I know Anna Therese is here um, from the HSE, the uh, Head of Research and Development, uh, which is a very welcome position created. And also the, the HRB has been uh, very supportive of this. Within our patient community, we have a number of patient leaders within the patient organizations, both at the umbrella level and at the condition-specific level. And we have an increasing amount of patient leaders who are being trained and being educated and are, are looking for opportunities to get involved. Um, and it's very obvious that patient and public involvement has become an international initiative. There are lots of networks, international and regional, uh, around the world, and they're all looking at the same thing. They're all looking to create frameworks of engagement, metrics to show the value of involvement, and this is where it's all at. Here in Ireland, as I said, we do have a very large interest in this area from the public and indeed from the media, and you, you need not look no further than the, the Health Research Board's initiative to, to uh, ask for public reviewers for research proposals as part of their schemes which w completely overwhelmed them in terms of uh, the public response. I think they had, initially they had 50 positions for public reviewers and they had 750 applications. So uh, within a two week period, it was phenomenal. So we see the same thing in our UPATI applications for the UPATI course, where if you just look at that graph, the big, the big outlier, which is the 23, is Ireland and they are applications to the uh, UPATI course. Uh, and that shows you just the, the level of interest in Ireland uh, uh, with respect to the other uh, countries. But we know that this is a challenge. We know that this is a, it's a messy thing, patient and public involvement. And for researchers, it can very, you can often fall into one of these three categories. Um, and from our perspective, we want to move the, the majority of the research community from the bottom of that iceberg up to the top. And how do you do that? Well, the good news is that the evidence is coming through around the value of PPI. The current challenges, though, it, within the Irish system are very well established, very well known. Um, everybody knows these exist. It's a question of how do we somehow address these challenges at a, in a systematic way. Um, it's starting to come together. There, it's certainly been a very positive year. And in terms of the metrics of the value uh, of involvement, that's definitely where it's at now because there's starting to be projects and initiative really looking at this at the international level and starting to, to be uh, adopted within uh, national perspectives. And we're looking at this within IPOSI, within the UPATI, but also within Ireland in terms of uh, patient-centered outcomes uh, and how we can increase the use of patient-reported outcome measures, increase the relevance of patient experience data, and really put that together uh, as a way of evaluating uh, how our healthcare is delivered, but also how our research is performed. And this is a good example of how you can assess maybe the financial aspect of, of uh, PPI. Everybody knows that you need to convince the, the health economists in this world, but uh, this is a 
just a, a really good example of where a particular clinical trial was able to show quite a significant financial benefit of avoiding uh, an amendment in their protocol design by uh, including patients. Uh, I'd encourage anybody to look at it. And we are uh, not a direct partner in, but there's a new kid on the block in terms of uh, European projects uh, looking at providing a, a framework for how patients are engaged. It's called Paradigm. It's an IMI project, and it'll be uh, working over the next two years to create a framework of engagement. And they're looking at three key decision points in the development of medicines, uh, and that's in the priority setting, in the engagement with the regulators and HTA bodies, but also importantly in the design of clinical trials. So uh, we'll be keeping an eye on, on Paradigm uh, through our work with UPATI. But just to, to finish and, and to come back to Julie's presentation, um, we feel that there is a huge, huge value in creating and building the capacity uh, of our patient uh, community in Ireland. And these are the kinds of roles that we would like to see. It's, it's ambassadors, it's journalists, it's facilitators and trainers. And you can see the impact that somebody like, like Judy has, has already made. And I know Mark and Eamon uh, very well, and they would attest to the impact that you have made on their research. Um, and certainly you're, you're continuing to make an impact on the, the work of IPOSI. So last year I presented a, one slide on a, an idea we had, which was a, an Irish version of the UPATI course. And we learned a lot from the uh, Irish UPATI trainees in terms of the way that that course was, was handled, it was the, the approach that they took. And we went about setting up our own Irish course. And we engaged with a number of uh, IPOSI members, but also uh, uh, state agencies and, um, and researchers. And this was our, our program. We launched it in May of last year, and we had three uh, six-week modules. Um, it was blended learning, so the, the, uh, the students got to uh, both meet and uh, work with the uh, members of the uh, education partners. In this case, it was the UCD Clinical Research uh, uh, Centre, the National Regulator for Medicines, the HPRA, and the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics in Trinity, together with the NCPE and HICWA on health technology assessment. It was a very comprehensive program. We ran it as a pilot, and we're, we just completed our evaluation of it. And it was an interesting uh, one because the education partners took the quite different approaches in terms of their ability to engage with either the existing UPATI content or their own content. And I have to congratulate each and every one of them for the commitment they showed in developing patient-centered curriculum and in delivering a very, very uh, enjoyable program for everybody involved. Um, and if I could just ask the, we've got a small video just to play us out. And uh, this, is, this is what it looks like now. The word hope is very important because when you have an illness like this, you just want to be able to make a contribution. You feel like you want to, to do something and I feel like I have been able to get involved. This is a global movement towards empowering patients to making more meaningful contributions. I thought it was a very interesting concept to train patients, you know, to be experts and, and to be able to interact on the same level with other stakeholders. This course is for a certain percentage of patients who need more information, that whatever sources they have or resources they're, they're getting, uh, it's not enough often felt a little bit out of my depth sitting in meetings with either people from the pharma industry or sitting with um, some of the leading you know, neurologists, the experts in the field, and I just would be sitting there going, I, I don't know what they're talking about. Patients do have a difficulty in understanding because the whole medical fraternity speaks in a language they don't understand. Really the whole point is to empower them so that when they're engaging with their healthcare professionals that they can have a conversation on a different level than they had before. Like the level of engagement is just fantastic. It's like an instant thing. They just, they wanted to be engaged, they wanted to be involved. But it's still true that it poses difficulties for people 
it isn't easy to assimilate this material. Like any language, it can be learnt and uh, the, the rewards when you can break the code and get in there are really uh, qu qu quite substantial. We require a commitment and quite often the commitment that we require won't actually suit everybody. It takes resourcing and that's true from agencies in relation to putting a time aside to that but in my view it's an investment that will come back four or fivefold for our agency in terms of the benefit that it'll actually bring to us. It also reflects the needs of our scientific and industry members who are increasingly under pressure to have patients involved in their processes but often they struggle to identify a cohort of informed, educated patients who are able to make meaningful contributions. Well, I think it used to be said about patients looking for representation in organizations was that uh, when they got there, they weren't doing very much. They, were, they didn't seem to bring very much to the party. The patients that we're training are equipped with the kinds of knowledge and the kind of experience that together make a far better contribution but patients need to be at the table and they need to be supported in the roles that are there for them. Students doing this course can appreciate the processes involved because they've done the clinical trial element, they've done the regulatory element, they're doing the health economics element. This course here in Ireland is really setting a headline, I think, because of the way it has involved the academic institutions and the regulatory institution. Any regulator at a national level that doesn't offer this, I think is missing out on a huge opportunity to be more effective and to be more impactful. Sometimes I think as patients we take what we're given rather than saying what we want and I think that this course gives you an opportunity to actually know what you want because sometimes you don't know what you need. So thanks to everybody who was involved uh, with that. I, I do have a couple of slides more, but um, I, I see we're, we're out of time. So I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. If anybody has any questions about our patient education program, please feel free to come up to, to us afterwards. But just in terms of where we're headed with this, I think um, we've certainly learned an awful lot um, from our experience in a European uh, initiative. And I think it's, 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 it's actually quite embarrassing that Ireland has yet to join ECRON and BBMRI. Uh, and it's something that I guess is, uh, in my background, it's, um, it's something that, that I know very much in terms of the value of joining. And um, if you can see the impact of, of something like, like UPATI, we're actually going to try and, and, and really ramp this up because Ireland is now leading in terms of patient education. It's leading in, in uh, patient and public involvement. And there's no reason why Ireland can't be a European leader on this. And there's no reason why we can't create a patient education platform in the same shape as a research infrastructure to ensure that all European patients, both in uh, Ireland uh, and outside of Ireland uh, get to do the kind of kinds of things that our trained patients uh, can do so thanks everybody <laughs>